We're here with uh, Noah Coleman, uh, tech editor of Vice News. Hey. <laughs> if he was tech editor of Vice, it would just be like, I took mushrooms and played Final Fantasy for 40 hours. <laughs> Did you get? Did you get to do any cool shit like that for uh, for your job? Uh, no comment. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't want to expose agents in the field. We're talking. We're here to talk tech, but before we get there, I want to talk our tech because we're now at Chapo Mark II. This is our first episode with our new professional audio setup, so you may hear in this new quality of audio that I, in fact, don't sound anything like Ben Shapiro. I have a full, deep, manly voice. Um, and that, like, you know, our heavy breathing will just sound all the more like we're lying next to you. Yeah, I'm not... Uh, because I'm not, like, leaning into the mic to uh, be heard, I, I'm more relaxed. Uh, more racial slurs may just <laughs> slip out because I'm in my easy chair and I go, Ooh, you know what I call Turkish people? I call them half Arabs. <laughs> and no matter what happens, I know that you will all keep telling me that my audio sucks because you're in a massive program of gaslighting <laughs> that I do not <laughs> fucking appreciate. <laughs> no, like I said, we, I, I, I want to talk about Silicon Valley, the culture and ideology of Silicon Valley uh, with someone who knows what they're talking about. But first, I need to ask you, Noah, I think what I think is the most important question related to this topic and that is what is up with elizabeth holmes's voice yeah it's got it's got to be a put on right people don't even know that they have a basic human right to be able to get access to information about themselves and their own bodies that can change their lives I honestly, I have no idea. Her whole personality, her like public affect, it's like, I, I don't get it. Where did she get the surgery to get the anime eyes? Uh, I, <laughs> I'm i not sure. I don't, I, I think it's, I think it's all natural. No, no, Go, no, ghost, maybe. ghost in the blood centrifuge. Uh, <laughs> you know what I like about Elizabeth Holm? Uh, she sounds like Lauren Lavoy. <laughs> you know what? You know what? Broadcast, don't come with erasers because <laughs> you can't change what's in your, in your hemoglobin. <laughs> no, no, I mean, like, we should, we should, we should, uh, we should get the, the audio edited in, but there's this clip uh, from her going on Mad Money. Well, this is like when the scandal sort of was, yeah, this for, is, first this is when, she, when she first went on to like defend her honor. And I think she she chose Mad Money because she was like, well, Jim Cramer's a friend or something. Or he, well, I mean, Jim, because like, every everyone dope. looks like a hundred times saner, <laughs> like next to Jim Cramer. Okay. Like if she went on like a, a, like on PBS, you know, you would like. I, I'm not so sure it would have gotten the same reception. But yeah, you know, she looked normal comparatively. Yeah, yeah, Jim Cramer's got his fucking sleeves like rolled up to half his shoulders. He's got coke drip. <laughs> just fucking violently rubbing his nose, and he's like, "Wow, tell me about the blood test." <laughs> and she's like, "Well, no, she, uh, people are jealous." <laughs> no, she's uh, she's she's going on there to like defend herself and, and the company, but I swear to God, like there there is like a couple seconds about halfway through the interview where she drops the weird like dad voice that she does we put on our website that we do venus testing so it's blood draws from the arm the traditional way and starting in 2015 we announced and it was published in san francisco paper in uh, fortune i talked about it in an interview i did with forbes that we made a decision to <laughs> nick, nick said her voice sounds like a like a kid calling their teacher pretending to be their dad to get out of going to school <laughs> accurate <laughs> Accurate. Or she's like, she's like, well, obviously we're like we're a company that has you know more strict testing than anything. But you know, honestly, from time like, it's really it's really odd. It's like she drops it for a second, but yeah, she sounds like Buffalo Jill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Jim Cramer, was she a great big fat person? What, what are you? What are you about a type type O negative? <laughs> Actually, no. This is a good. I want. I, I want to I wanna ask you. Like, can you give to our listeners like a the executive summary of the amazing Theranos catastrophe and scandal? Yeah. So, like, the the story goes back like a decade. So she's been working on this for a long yeah, time. So yeah. So Elizabeth Holmes. Most normal people. Most normal people. Boring people. When when you go to college, 
you go to your you go to your freshman classes, you go to your math class, your your gender class, your second gender class, <laughs> your third gender class, and then Bathroom but Elizabeth class. Holmes, she realized very quickly that she was meant for more, and so she went and she she I believe she linked up with a chemical engineering professor, something like that. And this is all at Stanford, right? Yeah, she's at Stanford, and she comes up with like this big idea, and her big idea is, what if we could do blood testing cheaper and with no needles? And she like, I don't know whether it's true or if it's part of the mythology, but like somehow like she has a fear of needles gets worked in at some point along the way. But so she's <laughs> like shocked. 19, she's I'm like shocked. 19 years old. And in like classic Silicon Valley fashion, she's like, there is this incredibly well-regulated like industry that involves the health and livelihoods of millions <laughs> of people in this country. And I could totally do it better. <laughs> and like, I may have like the chemistry expertise of like, what you would expect a 19 year old to have, but by God, I'm going to make this work. <laughs> and so she, uh, she launches Theranos. And so she is able to raise money from, and this is kind of interesting. She went around and raised money from a group of investors, none of whom were like considered like one of which is like a well-known investor, uh, DFJ Draper Fisher Yervitson. And like, they're a well-known investor mainly from like the last dot-com bubble but like everyone else it was like larry ellison's personal venture fund it was like kind of a weird group but whatever she raises the money and over a number of years like she raises progressively larger rounds that set the company's value ultimately at nine billion dollars that means that on paper elizabeth holmes was worth like four and a half billion dollars so the line that you kept hearing over all these years was that elizabeth holmes is the world's youngest self-made female billionaire which, like, you know, like, she leaned the fuck in. She's, she's on the conference circuit. Everyone loves her startup, except nobody knows what Theranos' technology actually does. They, like, Theranos, like, she's, like, very vague about all of it. And they sign a partnership deal with Walgreens, and they get, like, blood testing centers in Walgreens in Arizona. Like, she worked out some deal with those regulators. The Cleveland Clinic, you know, a prestigious medical institution, uh, like, links up with them in some capacity. And ultimately, like... Last October, a Wall Street Journal reporter, an actual like journalist, Pulitzer Prize winning guy named John Carrero, shout out, uh, real boss, um, he... The God. Yeah, exactly. He drops this huge story that's like basically Theranos' technology has struggled. It's not like, really clear if it works. Their chief like researcher scientist guy uh, committed suicide. It's possible that are, it was are tied Are you using to scare quotes around no, I'm not, suicide? Like, no, no, no. There is no... Like, it's... I. Like you, the reporting that's come out of it suggests that like a lot of it had to do with like the pressure he was under at work, which was to make this thing work that couldn't work. And so you get this portrait of Elizabeth Holmes that comes out, and it suggests that she's just like the master operator. It's fascinating. And so over a series of successive stories from the Wall Street Journal, it just becomes clear that like Theranos is like it's kind of well, it it, it looks like its technology doesn't work. And well, so the, the this nine billion dollar thing was like a total like the portrait scam. that emerged in the Vanity Fair article. That came out last week, which was incredible, was one of the most that it was like maybe Theranos was the most audacious con in American history. Well, it's it's wild because now you have and, there's and th an FBI investigation, there's another DOJ criminal investigation, there's an SEC investigation. And it, what's interesting, it, like the, the detail that sprung out to me in that article is when it talked about how he was getting the Defense Department involved in all of this. And there was some huge, there's going to be some huge contract for the Defense Department and uh, Mad Dog Mattis, a uh, recurring character on Champo, shows what, what? up as so, well. So there's, a, so there's an interesting tie-in here. Uh, I would like to name some members of the Theranos board right now. We have, number one, Alpha Dog Henry Kissinger. Boo, woo, number woo. two, former Secretary of State George P. Schultz. And lastly, former Republican Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, who, by the way, if I he was the guy who diagnosed Terry Schiavo on the video, yeah, and so Bill and Frist diagnosed uh, or uh, dissected cats as a child. And by the way, I believe he was the only person with a medical degree. He is a doctor, Bill Frist, MD. Um, he was actually the only doctor on their board, so now, she wasn't I, able to get like Reinhard Heydrich. I mean, <laughs> he wouldn't I return her calls. Uh, Kurt, Kurt Schlichter. Uh, <laughs> I mean, she picked all these board members Who because are ghouls. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she picked, so she picked all these like people close to like the U.S. government, and in part, like a lot of the reporting that's come out suggests that these kinds of people helped her avoid the kind of scrutiny that she otherwise would have gotten. Like, for example, there was she had had some contact with the military, and they looked at using Theranos' technology, and they were like, uh, no, and they notified the FDA or something, and like an, like an actual like regulatory authority, who then looked into it, and then, uh, like, 
Th- Holmes was able to like contact somebody she knew either through like on her board or somebody else she knew um, to like help make that go away. So in a lot of ways, it's it's like having these people on her on her board enabled her to get perpetuate this thing for like almost a decade. And and the most one of the most amazing details in the Vanity Fair article is when they talk about how she hooked up with Mad Dog Mattis, and then like the people in the army had a chance to look into the Theranos technology, right? And they discovered very quickly that not only could it not work because the technology didn't work, or like the the just it wasn't there, it couldn't work because it violated the laws of physics. <laughs> like it like it was like. Not just technologically wrong, but conceptually impossible. Well, see, that's always been a hang-up for a military. Like, human rights laws are, like, no problem. But physics, it's, like, physics, laws of physics Exactly. Are, there are people in the military at the bot- end of the day who do care about physics. They ca- well, they care about, they care about the law. And the law of physics is, laws of physics <laughs> are really important. That's so baffling to me about this is because most of the big financial scams over time are basically just fin- boiled down to financial black boxes. You know, you say... You invest some money with me, you'll get X number, and because they're doing a pyramid scheme or something, it works, and people have no way of knowing, so they all they see is the returns, and so well, they're and like, what's, cool. What's great about like a Theranos in some ways, and it's kind of instructive, to your point, is how Theranos, the, the excuse that Holmes and others used in defense of the company is, look... Like you look at LabCorp, look at Quest Diagnostics. Those places, like they have a huge lobby. They are like the status quo. They like do not want our. Like, we cannot let our competitive secrets. They're out the, the establishment. Bag. Exactly. They, they, they do not want uh, our secrets that have decide that have shown how the laws of physics have no I, longer apply. I guarantee you, if like the if like Theranos hadn't lost all credibility, like further into the 2016 election, Holmes would have found a way to like rhetorically align herself with Bernie Sanders. I'm 100 percent serious. Uh, I think I think like I actually wish I could go back in time and work for uh, Miss Holmes because I have the way to do it. Fuck this, like you know, status quo, blah blah blah. It's the Breakfast Club, and you're like, I have. You know, we came in here a killer, Mad Dog Mattis, a uh, uh, jock, Bill Frist, uh, the brain, Henry Kissinger, and Princess Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> and Wait. we came out revolutionizing <laughs> the way we take blood. <laughs> the blood club. Wait, but, like, how did the fucking fact that it's impossible never stop anyone? I, I mean, it's like, this is like Silicon Valley. At various times. I mean, so I want to, like, on some level draw, like, a slight bit of a distinction between, like, what Theranos does and the rest of the Valley. Like, Theranos, in a lot of ways, is pursuing something that, like, isn't your conventional Silicon Valley project. Like, your average tech company in Silicon Valley, it's, like, a bunch of people who stare at computers and, like, will never go near a piece of hardware, will never go near a piece of, like, medicine. It's, like, not, like, what they do. Never go near another human being. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Uh, Like, it's hoodies up, like, locked in. Like, you got it. Call the police the moment you see a homeless person. (laughs) And so... Where I think Elizabeth Holmes like was able to kind of succeed, like like the reason that nobody just like called bullshit was because they were doing a thing that a lot of people didn't understand. They were able to find a group of investors who maybe were not that scrutinizing, and additionally, like everyone, like like think like the story, like it was it's it's like really when you think about it, it's like an incre- an astonishing feat of marketing. Like she mapped out perfectly. Yeah. She like made sure she was on every major conference circuit. You, she made sure that like you know she was like included in every list of like important young like women in industry like she totally especially in recent years as like the I feel like the the level of discourse especially in Silicon Valley about like the underrepresentation of women and people of color has like has, has gone as like it's dramatically increased or it's become much more high profile. No, I was when when I after I read the Vanity Fair piece, I, I went back and I looked at Elizabeth Holmes' Twitter timeline and I was just scrolling through it over the past year and she didn't tweet much, but what she did tweet would be like today is the anniversary of Rosa Parks like refusing to stand up on a, you know on a bus like and then it was like you know hashtag women power like stuff like that no she I mean okay you want to know the, like the ultimate like Elizabeth Holmes hashtag women power move in March of this year or like I, I mean I wrote the story but she hosted fundraisers for Hillary Clinton Excellent. Oh, yeah. Will well, you Girl say like you know, she appeared with uh, she? I, there's a photo of her with Chelsea, but like this is in this year. The the journal, the first journal story, happened last October. There had been many reports, like much more detail, but all of the sketchy stuff going on there in between then. And she was she hosted an event. I remember it was yeah, it was like I mean I 
I wrote the story this past March, but yeah, she like at the Theranos like headquarters. Well, you talk about like the the uh, a triumph of marketing and kind of self branding and and promotion. I mean, to me, my favorite thing about her is that she just started dressing like Steve Jobs and talking about him all the time and wearing like a black turtleneck. And I think she really managed to convince a lot of people that she was the next Steve Jobs. I mean, it's it's like, but that just shows you how skin deep like people in Silicon Valley and, like, and, and the Silicon Valley press like tend to look at these kinds of people. Like that they really like legitimately, if somebody gets like the valuation of their startup high enough, and they begin to wear a black turtleneck, and they go on TV enough, and they repeat like the same like 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 meaningless platitudes, that like yeah, they're Steve Jobs. And that's where that story that got woven in at some point about how, well, she didn't like needles as a child, so she wanted to eliminate needles. It's like, oh, all of our iPhones don't have buttons on them because Steve Jobs didn't like buttons. And yeah. like those stories are supposed to inspire us like this person wanted to reshape the world in their image. But that, to me, is kind of terrifying that like a yeah. handful of these assholes in Silicon Valley can just like, you know what? I don't like uh, cabbage. Yeah, and but like the I difference don't like is Chinese people. <laughs> I don't. That's like, I, did, I didn't like people with I didn't, a certain degree of melanin in their skin. I didn't like Chinese people. I've got as a an kid. app for that now. <laughs> yeah. I uh, I didn't like broccoli, so I just got rid of it. I just invented a predatory seed. Uh, I didn't like immigrants. I didn't like gay people. That was like that's how they could have resold the Hitler story. Soil and they, like, I don't th- like that, food. I mean, let's, that, that's let's be the clear. Hitler, the Adolf Hitler story is like growing up. He's like looking at Jews, and he's like, "There's got to be a better way." <laughs> <laughs> like someone has to fucking do something. And it's like Hitler in a black turtleneck at like the the Munich Ideas Festival in 1937. Holding up a pellet of Zyklon B. And he's like, what if one molecule could change the world? Uh, oh, we've already taken. We've already. Uh, it, wow, we all outdid. What the is last it? Like, uh, Amazing. Yeah, Twenty minutes. And it's, uh, it took us a half an hour to get to Hitler. But, yeah. Real um, quick, baby. But no, I, I, yeah. But, but you know, go, uh, pivoting off that, like Noah, like Silicon Valley has become such a uh, like like the the name, the location. It represents so much. It's like become a metaphor. It's become a stand-in for so much uh, like in American culture and capitalism. So like. Like, what do we mean when people say, like, refer to Silicon Valley? Well, that's, a, that's, that's, that's actually a very good question. I think, I mean, to my mind, like, the thing that people kind of, when they say and they refer to it, is, like, they're referring to, like, the software and partly hardware industry centered, like, that originated in, like, the South Bay of, like, the South San Francisco Bay Area, and then has come to encompass San Francisco as well. But, like, software in particular, I mean, like, Facebook, Google, like... Apple makes software too, but like you know, like the iPhone and like Apple's obviously like like if not like a part of Silicon Valley, the center. But like fundamentally, like all of like this rapid quote unquote disruption and all that other and all that other like kind of claptrap is largely like it's drawn to like recent advances in the last ten years in software and just like how quickly. I mean, frankly, how much it can save in labor costs. Like fundamentally, that's what it is. I mean, like how much information and data is now worth because I also read again in that Vanity Fair article a statistic that sort of blew my mind it said Silicon Valley has is has generated more wealth in the last like decade or something than and like than anything else in human history I mean I would I I, I, I remember that line I, I mean it's Vanity Fair so I guess I got by a fact checker so okay, I guess well, it's true okay I mean like well crossing fingers there but I mean what's definitely true well is I like used the- to actually be a fact checker in the Condé Nast empire so chances are it's probably bullshit <laughs> <laughs> well I will say like the iPhone is the single biggest profit engine of like a single product ever like it's fundamentally like like Apple it made Apple into the most single valuable public company in the world the Saudis by the way are still the most with Aramco their oil hell yeah bitch yeah <laughs> Uh, but they they got the number one spot, uh, including public and private. But like it, it's, I think with like take Apple and the iPhone for example, like the iPhone more than anything. I mean, it's it's gener- it's created so much wealth, and a lot of which is just cash that's sitting in Ireland or whatever. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. Apple like isn't spending it. Like uh, I encourage anybody listening to this to go to Yahoo Finance and look at how much cash on hand Apple has, and think about you know how many people that could. Feed. Um, uh, excuse me. It's uh, it's a disruption fund. Okay. Yeah. Rainy day disruption fund. Yeah. 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 I mean, this is this, this is what I sort of want to say. Like, okay, it's it's a place. It refers to 
like you said, this this model of kind of like information capitalism, but it's also an ideology that's gotten bigger than the sort of products or apps or information itself, and like the, the ideology of kind of disruption and newness. It's like, what, like how would you describe that? I think like uh, so. One dude, Evgeny Morozov, had like kind of a cute way of, of describing it, which is like solutionism, which is that Silicon Valley is constantly fumbling toward finding solutions for problems that don't exist, um, which is sort of true. But like, I think what's a little bit more like on the nose is that Silicon Valley is like rapidly automating and and making more efficient processes like everywhere in your life. Like it's all the way from like, you know, like a really boring big data company whose job is to like process information incredibly quickly for large kinds of industries like or for like hospitals or uh, like gorillas in the Congo or whatever. Or you have um, like like on the other end of it, you have like Soylent which is like literally making more efficient your day-to-day life and making it so you don't have to eat uh, or really drink even. And so that you can like have like a whole meal because you just, you, you can't be bothered to like go and make yourself food or buy it. Soylent's uh, protein to carb ratio is fucking pathetic though. I just <laughs> want to say that. <laughs> fucking bi- what's, abysmal. Well, what's, that's what makes it so amazing to me because I think that one of the reasons that Theranos did so well for so long is because even if you would explain to people you know it's actually impossible to do that they would have been like yeah okay but i think a lot of them in their heart of hearts in silicon valley really believe that they are not bound by laws of physics i mean but they think that if enough brain power is put to these questions they can transcend what we think of as like reality peter thiel has called mortality an ideological concept i mean but i think that like the way to look at it is that like silicon valley more than anything it's like this perfect model of capitalism because if you look at the way that they think about these problems it's like well what what how do you measure success it's not by whether it accomplishes like some like meaningful goal it's that like is this wildly profitable and so like take uh like or it's like wildly successful i mean i think like the best example of like the kind of like rejoinder you're saying is like look at elon musk like this guy like everybody thought like you want to launch rockets and you want to like build these electric cars or whatever like that's that's crazy nobody can do that and like every all the short sellers on wall street like bet against him like eight years ago and somehow he made it out of that like he 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 figured out like how to do it didn't his rocket just blow up though i mean <laughs> yeah, I mean, but but that electric you fly, car had a basically I mean, I'm, I'm a ton not, of I'm, government I'm not, I'm not coming on Chapo Trap House to defend the sanctity of Elon Musk's name. But what I, I do want to say is that, like, there are specific times when you see something succeed like that, that does break the rules, that it gives inspiration to all these, like, code jockeys or whatever. And they're just like, oh, like, yeah, this is exactly like, like, of course, that makes sense. And so then it gives them like the they, that's how like they get into like you get these really dorm roomy conversations that will lead to startups about like, well, what if we could have a Bitcoin powered self-driving car that you can rent out to other people, which is a real thing I read about today. I'm going to create a toilet that analyzes your stool and takes Venmo. <laughs> you, I mean, Smart you joke, pipe. but like Smart Pipe. Yeah. Yeah. This is like a thing. Well. You I'm gonna break. take I'm gonna take a flashlight that texts through the temperature of your shaft what kind of mood you're in. Hardy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you even remember remember like vessel? Vessel, no, yeah. The smart cup. That? Oh god, it, the smart it, cup. It was a smart cup, and it, it told was like you what you were drinking. Yeah, it was, <laughs> it was a cup that told you what you had just poured it, into it. <laughs> It's and like you take a sip and it's like bleach, and it's like oh fuck, <laughs> god damn it! Oh, thank God that reminded me. Yeah, if fucking um, Hamlet's dad had had smart cop, well, oh, and then there right. was that. There was that. I don't know what has happened to it, but there was that Kickstarter for that ring that was like supposed to allow you to like virtually like sign into your computer and like stuff. Like you were supposed to like just use your hand gestures to like power all of your devices, and it just never fucking happened. But people, people, just thousands, thousands of yeah, dollars. Yeah, I will say my thing. one bit of advice uh, to anybody listening to this is like, generally don't back things on Kickstarter. Uh, no, Patreon. Patreon. You Patreon. Yeah. Oh my God. Uh, give your give your money to Grey Wolf. Um, <laughs> but like, it's no seriously, it's just like. One of the things that I feel like Silicon Valley has done, though, is that because it is like one part of it's probably the only part of our economy. It's the most like like it has the most uh, like cultural power right now. It's so resonant because it just makes a lot of money. Everybody wants to like go to 
learn to code and work for Google and Uber and so on that like it, it there's so many things that can just like adopt that sheen and like get away with crap and like Kickstarter is a place in a land where that kind of stuff no, lives. Uh, P- Patreon is the real deal folks that, hell yeah we, so they support creators but yeah. no I mean like I we're making fun of it yeah like, like uh, we're, Amanda we're, Amanda Palmer right <laughs> number one yeah, Patreon catching up, yeah, yeah, catching yeah. up. Yeah. Watch your fucking tail, Amanda. <laughs> you and your fucking husband, Neil Gamer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't checked it recently. I wonder if we're beating the erotic video game. Patreon. I hope we are. I, I hope I we're beating. Weren't like you beating like the number? This is like the number one podcast in Canada. Yeah, yeah fuck yeah, you, Canada. We did. Fuck we smoked you. Their asses, Canada land. Fuck you. Get that hey. oil price back up, bitch. <laughs> no, but like I said, we're making fun of it, but we're certainly a part of it. Like, yeah, we, no, we're yeah, really we're changed off, my life. Yeah, but you we, get something capitalized. Like yeah. you actually, it's not like hey, you know, it's it's a co- it's a vibrating. Co- Ring that like turns on your lights. You mentioned that it's it it's doing away with like the the old kind of like labor of production and and, and labor itself. And you mentioned the, the self driving cars. Now I wanted to ask you about this. I saw you recently took a, a spin in a yeah. I was in the car. driver's seat in one of a self driving Uber. Hello, I'm Johnny Cat. Where can I take you tonight? Drive! Drive! Would you please repeat the destination? Oh, anywhere, just go! Go! Please state a street and number. Shit. Shit! I'm not familiar with that address. Would you please repeat the destination? So, like, wait, you're sitting in the, like, explain this to me. You're sitting in the driver's seat of a car, but, like, you're not working the pedals or steering wheel? So you have to have your hands... So basically, the way regulators look at it is that they're like, well, this is just like glorified cruise control. So you have to just have your hands on the wheels at all times. So like you keep them at nine and three. Crucial. Yeah. This is this is seminal stuff here. So, yeah, I mean... It's a self-driving car that you have to have your hand on the wheel of. Yeah. Well, That's, so, I mean, but this is like the thing is that like you don't put your hand on it. You like hover over... Hover the hand. Car. You hover hand. Oh hard. my god, the yeah. future is god itself. I'm not hover handing my own goddamn car. <laughs> this, okay, I do it enough with my wife. <laughs> You're hover handing a car and you get an accident. It's like reverse JG Ballard. Uh, well, <laughs> wow. Literary reference. Yeah. Uh, uh, zing. Blow. Blow. Uh, so it, you you get in the car and like you start driving and like and then a light will go on and say like all right you can activate the self-driving feature and so there's like a little red switch if you've ever played a uh, need for speed video game or seen a fast and the furious movie yes. you'll recognize this as the nos button um <laughs> Fuck yes. in, but in uber uh it's like the it activates autonomous or so they have like a, na- a name for it i forgot but you hit that button and then it, it, so like it turns it on and then you can put your hands back and you let it hover but like the thing is is that like the car is a better driver than i mean I, it's probably not better than dale earnhardt jr I don't know about the quality of NASCAR. Uh, is it a better driver ooh, than Tony yeah, Stewart? It, it it's, fucking better be a better driver than Dell. Like, ooh, uh, or else uh, he said Junior. Junior, I said Junior, man. Okay, okay, okay. okay. I know the. I know I what happened to the. Say, yeah. Is it a better driver or, than Tony or else, Stewart? Or else Uber is going to be revolutionizing the way that we make pancakes. So, wait, you, so like, when when you turn on the self driving feature, it's like it's a really good driver. Yeah, I mean, this is this is the thing about it. Like, I like like don't. Is I would have. I would caution. I would caution against thinking that like this is like fluffy bullshit. Like it's not. It, this is like, going to happen is, in the next oh, wait, like but five. I, at what? some point, you're going to be able to not have your fucking hand on the. Yeah, wall, absolutely. Right? The okay, goal good. is Uber does not want anybody. Like think about it this way. They're right now, rid of all when I ride, when I ride in that car or like when those rides, because so Uber has just launched its pilot program, and so they're picking up people within certain spots in Pittsburgh, and so they have like where all the tech drivers, drivers comes from. They have Pittsburgh. a handful. Yeah, Pittsburgh, baby. There is a and lot of tech. In although Pittsburgh, I was just though. in Pittsburgh, yeah. I got to say, highly underrated city. Oh, it's fantastic. It's a great city. Shout out to Johnny is good. Shout out to. Hell yeah. Rock, Pittsburgh, represent. Uh, so, like, you, you, like, Uber does not, like, ultimately, Travis Kalanick, he tweeted once that, like, he wants Uber's whole fleet to be self driving by 2030. And so the idea is that, like, and, and Elon Musk and Tesla has talked about this, like, the, 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 the sort of long term vision that all these car guys have and car and tech car, car tech companies is that you, in the future, are just like, you own a car and that car makes money for you when you're not using it because this other service it'll be like giving other people rides who need to access it. Like I have a question. Uber. Wait, okay, wait, uh, what? 
Okay, so uh, I'm always like looking at the legal framework of things. I love legal th- frameworks, but real, real framework hours. Real framework hours. Smash that motherfucking amicus brief button. <laughs> but uh, so we watched, we talked about a movie last episode, and a crucial scene in the movie. Terrence Howard was getting some motherfucking top while driving his car, <laughs> and it enabled the cops to pull him over and be racist to him and his wife. In the future of self-driving cars, would it be a crime if your wife gives you top while you're like hover-handing your steering wheel? <laughs> this is a very important question. This is really important. Um, I would probably. I mean, like, I I hate to be a player hater. Uh, I hate to like you know find cracks in racial science, but I gotta say it probably would be a crime. Okay, why? so That's why stupid. this is bullshit? Why I, mean, I don't make the laws. Then. I'm just saying. I think it would be a <laughs> crime. What's, what's even the fucking point of having these? <laughs> yeah, there's both. Uh, destroy this thing. So uh, wait a minute. I'm kind of confused about this. So you're saying that because one thing that kind of puzzled me about Uber wanting to do self-driving cars is because I was like, well, their whole profit, you know, structure is involved around the fact they don't own any cars. So this is the people so, own the cars. So, but the thing is, is that like owning a car and having people constantly go through it. Like Kalanick has kind of said this before. He said that like the, 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 the perfect Uber like situation is like an endless ride. So imagine like a self-driving Uber picks you up, drops you off and immediately goes to another ride. And it never has to stop and it can drive for like 20, 20 hours a day. And then for those final four hours, what does it do? It goes back to the Uber garage and it charges because it's an all electric vehicle because all the car companies kind of accept that like the arc of history is long and it bends toward, you know, like the electric, electric car. car. Okay. Um, and so fiery death and destruction, actually, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. So the like, like in this case, like that, like Tesla's vision is that you own the Tesla and other people like pay for it, which is like a weirdly have and have not kind of vision, but whatever. It's like, and I- then like Uber, though, think about it this way. Like, like. We went from in music, for example, like we used to download MP3s and shit. And so you said like you whether you like torrented them or you bought them on iTunes, like you owned a file independent of whether or not there's like DRM or other software on there. You owned the thing. But now like the fastest growing way that people listen to music is they pay 10 bucks a month to like have access to a library. So with Uber, the idea is that you would pay to have access. But to who, an Uber. Bu- who actually buys the car? Uber would ultimately, in this case. But see, but Uber that, like they don't does, have any money. Yeah, but they, Uber, but they like, don't. Keep they don't. They don't want to have. But like, um, like, what is what is more expensive? Seriously, what is more expensive? Having a car that you own and that if it's electric won't have crazy high maintenance costs like internal combustion engines and will just like go around constantly picking up people with rides and you can use a smaller number of them because they're much more efficient or like splitting the fare with tons of drivers who are like a pain in the ass to deal with. Because they're labor, they're humans, flesh and blood, and why would you ever want to actually, you know, employ people? That is, that does make all of their bullshit. Whenever they're wedging themselves remora like into a new, a new market, talking about how in sanctimonious tones about how concerned they are for people to be able to make a living and how they're making it possible for people to make ends meet by being Uber drivers, when secretly their entire fucking profile is to eventually fire them all. <laughs> well, this is, so this is what's so crazy because if you think about like a lot of these companies, like, and this isn't just Uber, like this is this is like what Silicon Valley, like I, I, I feel a little bit like like I'm. I, like I'm being very dark about this, but if you look at cities across the, like the U.S., like whether you're in Tucson, Arizona, or Cleveland, or New York, like increasingly, like the software industry will come to your town. More and more people are going to work in it, and it's going to automate progressively more jobs. It's not just going to be like manufacturing kind of jobs. It's going to dramatically change like the way white collar industries work as well. And like we are totally unprepared for that reality, just for like mass labor displacement. Well, we I mean, don't have any answers. Is, like that is the Marxist fa- uh, dream. That's what's supposed to happen in Marxist teleology: is we get to a level of technological uh, advancement that makes work basically unnecessary, and then we socialize the production of all of these machines. But we have private ownership of all these machines. So there's we have a, patents there's like a really held by all this technology. There's a really kind of compelling argument about how like Uber and a lot of the competing ride-hailing companies are kind of like the early su- private subway companies in New York. And what ended up happening to the subways is like they. They they got like they became public, so I think like it's it's there's like a really interesting argument about how like what Uber's ultimate goal is their end game like a lot of these other kinds of companies like globally is that they want to privatize mass transit. There's a really good Travis Kalanick op-ed from earlier this summer in which he talks about like the limits of mass transit, and I say good only because it's instructive to like what the company wants to do. It's like worth reading, and he makes this argument about how like yeah mass transit's inefficient, but like here is like what we're gonna 
going to do. And he lays out this vision of like, imagine like a ride that never stops going and that you can like pick up, get in a car with other people. You pay a flat fee and it'll take you these, like these, like, it'll, it'll take you much more quickly. It's kind of on demand. And it's like, it's like a pretty like it's kind of jarring to read it. But where That's where did you where Snowpiercer? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Where did you get the money to pay to take the ride though? Like how did you get the money to pay to ride around in the magic robot car? Me? No, I mean the person in this future. Oh yeah, no, I I mean that's that's but this is like does like companies don't answer like this is the thing is like no tech company is gonna answer that question, and you and like I mean for like kind of like obvious reasons like. Like does does like Uber wants to? I mean, this is by the way. Like, there's some interesting like on like not like on the flip side, but like there's some recognition of this reality. It's like why Travis Kalanick like goes to bat for Obamacare because he recognizes that like if we're creating like a perma class of people who do not have like an employer provided insurance, then like where's that going to come from? And but how are they even going to fucking pay for that? I mean, this is again Obamacare like, sucks. Yeah, it's fucking awful. It's shit. Like, so, but like again, this is like why we come to this place where this really kind of weird dystopian future where like more and more wealth than ever before is being generated and the fruits of it are going to go to like an increasingly narrow slice here's, of people. Here's my it, vision. It's going to go to people who give it to Elizabeth Holmes. <laughs> like, holy <laughs> shit. Yeah. It's like Gabo, but with blood. <laughs> Jesus. Here's my, here's my vision of a dystopian future based on what Noah was just telling me. Okay, I have my electric car. It's my electric car. I've paid for it. But I pay for it. I'm, like, I'm paying it off by the fact that when I, I like, I get in the electric car, I get I go to work, I get out of the car, the car just keeps going and picking up other people. Like you said, the ride never stops, but it's my car. And like, they're just in there pissing and coming and just eating food and so here's fucking, the, here's the be- fucking up all my shit. So here's the best. Smoking cigarettes. It's like taxi driver. He's like, at the end of the day, when my electric car came back to its pod, I had some nights I had to wipe the blood and come <laughs> off the seats. <laughs> So here's the best part about the Uber I took a ride in. The Uber is just like my record. It's clean. <laughs> I, uh, well, I went in, uh, when I got in the self-driving Uber, there was like a little camera on, on the sunroof. Uh, and I looked at the, I looked at the camera and I, and then I like, asked the like engineer and oper- like the vehicle, like operator I was in the car with. And I was like, what's that for? And he's like, oh, it's just like, so we can observe people who like get in the car, check out their behavior. Um, <laughs> and I was like, you so you notify people about this, right? And they, they couldn't tell me at the time, but then I, I talked with like, uh, like, a, like a spokesperson later and they're like, yes, we like tell people in the email that like they get recorded. But it made me think that like, oh, because like in this future where everyone's just like in this endless ride or whatever, like, like w- what if someone just like, like just like pukes? Because like, you know, like, there's no self-cleaning car yet so what happens and I realized oh they're just going to film it and then they're going to bill the person who ever took <laughs> yeah. the ride and you're still going to have to clean up and, their like vomit and if you had sex in the car they put it on their streaming porn site and charge people to watch that yeah I want to I want to just be like always working I'm in the car I'm camming I'm at home I'm camming I just never want to stop camming this is cam boys cam boys I'm camming here I'm camming at the gym I'm camming at my house I'm camming at dinner I'm all the time I'm camming oh man uh, the future is so bright we gotta wear shades oh okay. I can't wait what, what do you say you wanna, you wanna cap it off there yeah I think so good. let's do uh, it but before we go uh, hold on I have to go in another room to be racist but uh, someone is calling oh we got we got a call it, it's Elizabeth Holmes oh, oh dear wait a sec we've been slandering her this entire episode but maybe we should hey hear- guys <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth Elizabeth uh, thanks thanks for calling in. You're welcome. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, I, I, I have the next best thing for you, and I'm wondering if maybe you would consider investing it. Uh, let me ask you, are you familiar with Stevia? <laughs> oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> are you from, are you, do you know that Stevia is going to revolutionize healthcare? I know all about my prayer. <laughs> do, you, are, do you also know about the fountain, Elizabeth? Uh, I, I know violin, about the violin. The violin, the violin I've had it played on me several times. Bob Mad Dog Mad. Dog Mad, 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 Elizabeth, Mad Elizabeth. Dog Mad plays that violin like a champ. Elizabeth, hold on. Uh, actually, Elizabeth, now you're in the room with us. Do you mind if I perform the violin? On Go to right town now? on my pussy. <laughs> 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 Triple dicky <digital> orgasm. <laughs> that was oh. great. <laughs> Elizabeth, uh, th- thank you for uh, coming here and letting me perform the violin on you. All right, I have to leave now. 
<laughs> please, please invest in Chapo. <laughs> <laughs> Our IPO's coming up. See you, everybody. We can know us. Later. <laughs>